by reading the word of the Lord. And uh, I'm going to read to you from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 12, from versicle 1 on. Accept the correction of the Lord. What a cloud of innumerable witnesses surround us. So let us be rid of every encumbrance, and especially of sin, to persevere in running the race marked out before us. <clears throat> let us look to Jesus, the founder of our faith, who will bring it to completion. For the sake of the joy reserved for him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame, and then sat at the right of the throne of God, Think of Jesus who suffered so many contradictions from evil people, and you will not be discouraged or grow weary. Have you already shed your blood in the struggle against sin? Do not forget the comforting words that wisdom addresses to you as children. My son, pay attention when the Lord corrects you, and do not be discouraged when He punishes you. For the Lord corrects those he loves and chastises everyone he accepts as a son. What you endure is in order to correct you. God treats you like sons and what son is not corrected by his father? If you were without correction which has been received by all, as is fitting for sons, you will not be sons but bastards. Besides, when our parents according to the flesh corrected us, we respected them. How much more should we be subject to the Father of Spirits to have life? Our parents corrected us as they saw fit, with a view to this very short life. But God correct us for our own good, that we may share His holiness. All correction is painful at the moment, rather than pleasant. Later it brings the fruit of peace, that is, Holiness to those who have been trained by it. Lift up then your drooping hands and strengthen your trembling knees. May level the ways for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but healed. The word of the Lord. So we are going to reflect upon reconciliation. And uh, as Catholics, we have been taught so many times about it. But the lesson of faith has to be talked every day. Because, not because we don't get it and because we don't understand it. It's because we need to be reminded every time. <clears throat> our nature, our flesh is too heavy <clears throat> and tends to what is the wrong way. So we have to correct our ways all the time and remind ourselves as to what we have to do, even though we know it. Still, it's like when you drive in a car at high speed. You know how to drive, but that doesn't mean you're going to take your eyes off the road. You have to be with your eyes on the road, attentive at all time, all the time. And that's life. Life on earth is driving at high speeds. We have to be alert and vigilant. And one of the ways to be totally alert and vigilant is to reconcile constantly with God. You see, as you're driving at high speeds on a freeway, you know you have to correct your ways in order to avoid accidents you, and, and in order to be on time and do the right thing. Life is exactly the same. We have to correct our ways. We have to mend our ways. We have to constantly correct our direction because it, it, ter it, it tends to go off. You see, our hands are not always on the right poles and sometimes it slips. So we have to be correcting our way and that's why reconciliation comes along. God knows who we are, and God knows what we need, and that's why He gave us the Sacrament of Reconciliation. We have to begin by understanding this. People have a tendency, and especially in today's Christianities, there are too many ideas and to, make, to water down the traditions and the faith. And one of them is the, the Sacrament of Reconciliation is being watered down through the years. Today is so weak. A lot of people don't even exercise it, don't even embrace it. And that's why we are so weak, because we don't understand how important it is. I, I was speaking about it during my testimony in the prior talk, that the Lord showed me how He, when He resurrected, when Jesus resurrected, 
he appeared to the disciples, to the apostles, and he told them that he was giving them the power to forgive sins or to retain them. And then you understand that the sacrament of reconciliation comes all the way from Jesus. It's nothing that anybody made up. It's something he established. And it is a fact that it is a sacrament. We are to reconcile with God, legally reconcile with Him. When I say legally, is that we have to go through the church. It's not a personal thing that you go on your own and reconcile with God as many Christianities of today do. Because they came up with a new idea of the sacrament. And the sacraments are not to be remodeled, they are not to be refurbished, they are not to be changed. No one can change a sacrament. You see, sacraments are sacraments that are sacred, and they are sacred tradition, they are established by God, the way they are. So reconciliation is about going to the middleman, about going to the priest. I give you an example of something the Lord showed me about reconciliation. Jesus walked in his public life through the Judea and through, you know, the areas where he grew up, up in Capernaum and Tiberias and all of these areas. He, when he was in his public life, he healed a lot of people and most of them he healed on the side of the road as he was just walking through towns and living his public life. Every time that he healed someone, he sent them to the temple to purify themselves with the priest. See, and he was God. So you may wonder, why will he send someone he already healed to go to a priest that was most of them unfaithful, that most of them wanted to kill Jesus? And he still sent them to the temple to purify themselves with the priest. And what he was teaching us with that was teaching us obedience. We are on earth, we are people that have to be obedient to natural laws in order to embrace supernatural laws. For us to be supernaturally in harmony, we have to be naturally in harmony first. It's like, a, like when you're going to a, send a rocket into the sky. You, before you send the rocket, you have to prepare those, those propulsion rockets, You're the ones that, that, that ignite in order to send that rocket out into the space. And there is a part of it that falls back to the earth. That part is the, the lower ground, that, but that is the, a vital part of the, of the shuttle. You know, we, you have to have that impulse, that, that combustion that comes from the rockets that, that will, se will send, will shoot that rocket into the space. There are two parts there. So we have to prepare this, this shuttle. You know, we have to prepare this, uh, this lower self and ignite it in a way to send the soul up into the skies, into the outer space, into the space of God. So we have to prepare ourselves. Reconciliation is about understanding obedience. It's the first ingredient. You know, people are so filled with pride, Catholics. The first thing they do is, I don't need to go to a middleman to go to God. Priests are worse sinners than me. I'm not supposed to go to them. What if they are pedophiles or homosexuals or, or they have a woman with children or they are thieves or heretics? Or, I don't know. I don't want to deal with them. They, they don't deserve to hear my sins. You see, that's pride. So a lot of people go miles and miles looking for a holy priest to go to confession because the local party priests uh, do not deserve to hear your sins, right? It's not worthy of your sins. It's pride. Pride. You see, if we understand the middleman, the middleman is about humbleness, us being humble, regardless of the priest. See, when Jesus sent the apostles the first time, you probably remember what he told them. And he, among them was Judas Iscariot. And when they came back, all of them, including Judas Iscariot, they were in awe as to what they'd done in the name of Jesus. They deliberately possessed Man, they, they healed the sick, they did all kinds of things, wonders. They were in awe. And Judas was a, an unfaithful priest. And he, the Lord, through him, did all kinds of wonders. And so it's not about the priest. The priest is an instrument. The priest could be a mess. And the Holy Spirit still acts through the priest. 
It's like a judge. You know, a judge can put you in jail, and only that judge can get you out of jail. And the judge could be the most devastating, corrupt judge. But he was given the power to be a judge. And he can put you in prison or take you out of prison. So you have to understand the rules. So we have a church. And it's not an accident that we have a sacrament of reconciliation. God gave us this sacrament for us to embrace it in the fullness of it. In spite of the human side of the church. The human side of the church is imperfect and is miserable. And it's mostly unfaithful. But it's not about human beings. It's about God. So we are, it's like when you give money to the church. You give your tithes to the church. You bring that money. And some people wonder, I wonder what this priest is going to do with my money. It's not about that. Let them steal it if they want to. They have an account with God too. You bring the money to God. You think God needs money? God doesn't need any money. God doesn't need your money. But he needs your obedience. That's what God needs. So you bring the tithes to the church to obey God. Because money doesn't mean anything to God. Remember what Jesus did with Peter when those Sadducees came tempting Jesus, asking him if he paid taxes. And then when they walked away, he told Peter, go and catch a fish and open it up and you're going to find there a coin and pay your taxes and mine. And, Jesus, and Peter went to catch a fish, catch the fish, open it up. There was a coin there in the fish. What is the message behind that? See, God is the maker of everything. Money is nothing to God. So when you bring the tithes to the church, you are in obedience. You are doing something to obey. If the priest steals the money or whatever, it, it's not of your business. Whatever they want to do, money doesn't mean anything. But what means is the obedience, what you have to do. You are called to do that. It's like when you are obedient, they tell you, be here at 3 o'clock. You're there. Even if you know everybody else is not going to make it at 3 because they are disobedient. You're there. doesn't matter. It's just discipline. It's obedience. Honesty. It's integrity. All of this we need in order to be spiritual. So the sacrament of reconciliation is about being obedient. That's what it is. And that builds us up. You see, if you go frequently to confession, the worst sin you can have is not to be able to find any sins. That's the sin of pride. You see, sometimes you sit down and say, I wonder what I have to confess. I don't have anything to confess. Oh, that's when you are in bad shape. See, imagine saints, they find sins all the time to confess. And how come you've been two or three months without confession and you don't know what to confess? That's how bad you're doing. You see, you don't even have a conscience of sin any longer. And it's not that you're going to become a scrupulous where you're going to find that everything is sinful. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about falling on the other side of the fence. I'm talking about being meticulous, not scrupulous. Meticulous. You have to understand that we sin. Check out. I mean, check it out. You, you know, you drive through the streets. Where do your eyes go? Sometimes you are so prayerful and so faithful in so many ways. And your eyes, your eyesight is a mess. It goes everywhere. And you don't pay attention to what you see. You don't pay attention of anything you do in your, with your eyesight. You take everything in and you bring all kinds of stuff into yourself just by wildly opening your eyes everywhere. And you feel you haven't done anything because you're not physically acting upon anything. You're just roaming through earth, just opening up to everything, silently sinning, right? I'm not, seeing, I'm not saying that just by seeing the world you're sinning. But you know what I mean by that. Sometimes we stare at things we're not to stare. And we stay there too long. Too long. It's like some people watch this TV all the time. And they say, I only watch holy channels. And, and I entertain myself with discovery and these animals and that. And good movies. And so before you get to those good channels, you browse through a lot of channels to get there. You open little windows like that. You know how much does your mind takes to make a whole movie? Just a dot, a dot of a bad sight is enough for you to make the rest of the movie. See, your heart opens up into imagination, just touching something. So we have to understand that sinning is something we have to really understand what it is. But be, but be aware, it's not about being scrupulous. It's about being meticulous, 
careful and vigilant and understand that we have some tendencies to go into the wrong places, drop ears where we're not supposed to, stare at things we're not supposed to stare, say things we're not supposed to say, keep things to ourselves when we're not supposed to keep them and, and fall into omission, and do so many things and hug and embrace what we're not supposed to hug and embrace, and so many other things. Let our feet go in the wrong direction and have this anxieties and fears and doubts because of managing wrong all our actions. Then we end up depressed, confused, insecure, troubled because we are acting wrong in every sense. So if we continuously bring ourselves into confession and go and say, I have a weakness with my eyes, I have a tendency to stare at things I'm not supposed to, my tongue is so fast, I say things I didn't even know I was going to say. And after I say, I repent that I, I can do nothing because I already did wrong. And that my ears are always going in the right direction to listen what I'm not supposed to listen. And all of these things. And you will find a lot of situations today in our church that is so weak and undernourished. You will find a lot of priests that are going to get upset about some of the sins you're going to confess. But don't pay attention to that. Just say, okay, I'm sorry, but could you give me an absolution, please? That's all it counts, you know? Because sometimes they priests tell me, uh, wait a minute, uh, you're getting a little bit out there. That's exaggerated. I say, Father, I'm very sorry. Could you absolve me, please? That's the main thing, because I confess already. And you see, one of the biggest stages of reconciliation is to understand the blind man on the road, the blind man of Jericho. Jesus, son of David, have mercy of me. What do you do? You go by the blessed sacrament. That is the side of the road. That's where we meet Jesus, on the side of the road, by the blessed sacrament. Go there and make your most detailed confession. Because it's to him that you have to go first. As the blind man on the side of the road, right? You go to Jesus and he will heal you right there. And then you will go to purify yourself with the priest after you've been healed by Jesus, one-to-one, -one, confessing to him directly and saying, i done this and that and that and that in detail. And then when you go to the priest to purify yourself, you don't have to go into detail unless the Holy Spirit asks you through the priest to give you details. But you can say, I kill, I lie, I fornicated, I did. Just say the sin, but don't go into details. I was somewhere and I tried to do this and it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I went to my grandmother and then, you see, <laughs> priests get upset. They say, come on, go on with it. You know, it's like, you, see, that's what you have to tell Jesus on the side of the road. Go to Jesus and say, I was my grandmother's house and I was doing this. <laughs> Jesus knows all of that, but he wants you to tell him. Yes, because he wants you to be conscious of what you do. But you do that with the Lord. Then when you go to the priest, go and tell him, I kill, I lie, I fornicate it. You see, I did that. And that's easier. If the Holy Spirit wants you to give details to the priest to make, to humble you even more, the priest will ask you, what do you mean fornicating? How many times have you done that? You know, so, so you have to, you know, then you have to go into this. Uh, so, but we have to understand that reconciliation begins with God. Begins with God. That's where the reform went wrong. You see, the reform went wrong because they picked up the side of the road confession. And they kill the purification in the church. So they abolish the sacrament of confession altogether. That's how the devil got them. You see, it was a temptation. And they fell for that. And then they became weaker. It's a very weak Christianity without the sacrament. Very weak. I tell you what the Lord revealed to me. As you know, I've been away from the church for 33 years. I'm new. I just came back, you know, like 12 years ago. That's not too long for a 58-year-old man, right? That was born that a cradle Catholic. So, the Lord showed me this. The unity of Christianity is not going to happen because of a dialogue between us, not because of ecumenism. Ecumenism is good because it keeps us sort of like friends. But it's not, unity is not going to come through ecumenism. Unity is going to come because of the pressure of the world. But do you know what type of unity? All of these Christianities that have no sacraments, they're going to fall on the side of the road. They're not going to be able to stand the times we're going to face. Because they're going to become so weak before the forces of the devil. 
In order to survive the forces of the devil at the end of times, you got to have the body and blood of Jesus. Otherwise, you won't survive. You won't survive as a Christian. I'm not saying that everybody else that is not taking communion is going to go to hell. Don't take me wrong. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying to survive as a Christian soldier, to be able to confront the forces of the dark, being a soldier of God, you have to have the fullness of the faith. Otherwise, the devil is going to get you. And you know how the devil is going to get you? He's going to drown you into the world. That's what it is. You're, not going to, you're going to end up with a fake Christianity, absolutely fake Christianity. You notice how in China, in the mainland, they have a fake church, a made-up church. And they have bishops and all of that. It's a, it's a church built up by the government. And, and the people are followers of that church. It's a fake Christianity. And you won't believe how they deal with Christianity, the way they made it up. And it's a fake religion, but it's Christian, supposedly. And that's the way it's going to happen all around the world. They're going to have a fake Christianity. A Christianity that's made up by people. And then and God is good. God knows all of us. Hallelujah. We are already saved. He, he died for us. You don't have to worry about sin. Nothing like that. Hallelujah. God saved us and that's it. See, no, nothing else. That's a, an ideal Christianity for these worldly people. So, but today we have to understand that we were called to be who we are, and we cannot negotiate this with anything else. So the sacrament of reconciliation is an encounter with humbleness. We have to bring ourselves down to our knees and humble ourselves deep enough to understand that we have to bring this heart of, 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 of so hard that we have, bring it down and, and present it to God through the priest. Go, in spite of the priest. You see, one of the biggest tortures you can bring to Satan is go to a terrible priest, a priest that you know that is terrible, disobedient, horrible, and you go to that priest and confess. Imagine how painful that is for the devil. The devil is going to say, no, not to him. Don't ask him for forgiveness. See, because he knows, in spite of that priest belonging to the devil, just the fact that he absolves you, you're going to be absolved. Imagine how painful that is. Because the devil wants you to hate the priest. The devil wants you to despise the priest. Because that's his job, to get you to hate clergy. Because that's one of the, your worst sins. You need to come against the people of God that are chosen to be priests. If you want to get in trouble with God, hate a Jew or hate a priest. You see? Those are two big problems with the Lord. See, Jews could be who they are, whatever they are. Don't even touch them. Don't touch them. They are the chosen of God. And God prefers them above many people. He doesn't prefer people by, because they are people, but they are the chosen people. Believe it or not, it's a fact. You don't deal with that. You see, before Jesus comes back, Israel has to convert. For the second coming, Israel has to convert. It's a condition, you see, for the second coming, for the parousy. And the devil knows that. And that's why the devil has tried to destroy the Jews all along since Jesus ascended to heaven. Because he pretends that he can exterminate them. And then stop Jesus come back. He can never make it. He's done a mess, you know, because he's killed so many. But he still not be able to exterminate them because it's not the will of God. The plan of God, the plan of salvation is going to come to fruition. Because that is the will of God. So he's not going to be able to exterminate the Jews. So that's why when we deal with the church, there are sacred areas you don't want to touch. You don't want to mess with that. It's not a good idea. See, if you read the book of the Maccabees, you know what I'm talking about. Just read the books carefully, and you understand what chosen people is about. So it goes on, it continues. God keeps his promises. The Jews have been given a blindness. They are not able to accept the Messiahs until God wants to. At the end, when the number of Gentiles is fulfilled and they enter the glory, then the Jews are going to convert. And they're not going to convert before. Just when God wants to, the day that number is fulfilled, the number of us, of ours. So it's very important to reconcile with all of that. You know, if you are someone that is in tune with the media, 
you, you're going to have greater difficulties to be disciplined because of this. The media will give you um, a lot of ideas. And the first idea the media is going to give you, the media is going to give you the worst spirit that is roaming the earth today. It's called the spirit of division. You see, the media is going to locate you somewhere as a race, as a nation, as a culture, as a tradition, as an education. It's going to divide you in a million pieces. And it's going to show you preferences according to the country you live, according to the politics you live, according to your economy, and it's going to turn you into a mess. You're never going to be able to become a spiritual if you're so divided. So you have to reconcile also with divisions. If you are not able to accept Muslims and these people and the other and the other as one, as the same, you are in trouble. You're not reconciled. How could you go and feel that like you reconcile with God when you feel different than a Muslim, when you feel different than a pagan, when you feel different than an atheist or a mason or someone else in life, when you feel different than them? How could you ever feel reconciled with God? You couldn't possibly. In order to be reconciled with God, you have to love everybody and accept them like they are. It's a mystery that someone is a mason. It's a mystery that someone is satanic, that the other one is a Hindu, the other one is a Muslim, a Jew. All of, I mean, it's a mystery. So many things happening at once. But how do you overcome all of this and become a child of God, a simple child of God, letting go of all these divisions and looking at people as souls, not as just a simple representation of a temporary life that is just like an act, like a drama, like a temporary state of being that is not going to last. You see, if you die in a place where there are Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, and Atheists, and Masons, and all kinds of people there in one room, and they all die together. You see, once they come out of their bodies, they are just souls. No, Nobody is going to be a Jew, a Muslim. Nobody is going to be that. They're going to be children of God, the spirits of the Lord, and they're going to have to be facing God because of the actions. On the actions, you know, in life. Nothing to do with religions, races, nothing like that. And that's why it is so important to reconcile ourselves with humanity. Because otherwise, what good does it do? You go to confession now and say, I lie, I stole, this and that. If, if you are not able to love everybody equally, then you're not reconciled. And you know something is wrong with you. You come out of confession feeling guilty still. Say, ah, I wonder what's happening. You know, I went to confession and I feel something is wrong. I don't know what it is. Well, what it is is that you don't have your act together yet. You still have a lot of territory to forgive. You still are divided. You still think. Some people are so divided, they think they're better than others. You, you met people like that, you know. Some people feel of a better race of a better culture, or a better family, privileged because they have more education, more money, or whatever. You see, they are lost, completely lost, a tragedy. When you are like that, you could never see the eyes of God if you die today like that. You will never see the Lord, no. So, we have to reconcile today and say, forgive me, Lord, because I felt I was better than, some, than my neighbor, because I felt I'm better than a Muslim, better than this, better than the other. And thus, those are sins. Those are sins. They, they divide us. They separate us from the love of God. And that, that way, we're not going to have peace of mind, peace of heart. We're not going to have the joy of God. So reconciliation is about understanding love. That's reconciliation. It's discovering all the emptiness of our hearts. See, our hearts are empty of God because we don't love good enough. We think we love, but at the end, if you check yourself out, maybe you loving those that love you, as the Gospel says. you forgiving those that forgive you. Or forgiving those that you love, regardless of what they do. But you forgive those that are beneficial to you because they are your emotional company, your affection company, and all of these things in the family or friends or business, your personal interests. And in that particular area, you forgive, you reconcile. But the rest of the world is unreconciled with you because you have attitudes, you have positions against people, against certain areas of life, against certain areas of your family, or your past, of ancestors and so many things 
you have problems with. Even with life, a lot of people are not able to reconcile with life. They feel life is unfair. And why me? And why, the, and why all these people are making it and I'm not? And why all these good things happen to these people and not to me? And so many other things that are unreconciled. Sometimes we have problems with God and we don't even know it. You see, a lot of people have doubts and don't have faith because they don't have a reconciliation with God. They are not at peace with God. That's why they lose faith. I have seen people through my apostolate that I see, let's say, I met a lady in the year 2000. And then I come back two years later to the same city, same church. And that lady that was on fire in the spirit, that was the most anointed lady, speaking in tongues and doing all kind of wonders, praying over people, 20 people falling in the spirit. Oh, it was on fire. Two years later, face dropped, down, sat. And I say, what happened? I say, I'm mad with God. I say, he took my son. Why? Why had to take my son? Say, I've been with God all my life. I was always there. And he took my son. See, imagine that. Imagine. I mean, this is so terrifying to see this happening. So she was there as long as things were working, as long as things were flowing, as long as things were okay. But when things went wrong, then she had problems with God. And all that anointing, all that incredible presence of God in her was gone. Overnight, gone. The whole community was trying to lift her up. She was mad. She was upset. She was really mad. And that happens to many of us. We are conditionally loving, conditionally living. But it's not about that. To reconcile is to unconditionally love, unconditionally live our life. We couldn't possibly live unconditionally and be of God. There's no way. We couldn't put a condition to God's love. We have to go through life without complaining and asking any questions. See, that is the way of the apostle. That is the way of the true child of God. Don't challenge God. If you read the scriptures well, and St. Paul tells us that, whatever took place in the desert with the people of God is a warning for us. A warning for us that live in today's. Because... The people of God in the desert, they tempted God. And over 20,000 died in one day for tempting God. Because they, you see, the wrath of God will fall directly on them. The ozone layer of the spirit was broken. You see, there was no Jesus in the middle. Today we have Jesus as the priest, the high priest sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he will filter that wrath of God through reconciliation. We don't get killed instantaneously as the people of God did in the past when Jesus uh, was not incarnated yet and didn't ascend to heaven yet. But now we have Jesus. And that's why the wrath of God doesn't fall on us as long as we go to reconciliation. As long as we make it there. Otherwise the wrath of God is going to fall on us directly if we don't go to the tribunal. To the tribunal of mercy and go for forgiveness. So we have to understand how important it is to reconcile from the bottom of our hearts and to reconcile with every aspect of our life. Not just, you see, remember the young rich man of the gospel? He was obeying the commandments. So you might go to confession and say, sorry, I stole, sorry, I lied, oh, I fornicated. And then you walk away thinking you, you confess everything. But you didn't confess that you have an attitude with people, that you, 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 you select people. You don't, you don't confess that you lack charity, that you lack compassion, that you, you forgive only those that are convenient for you to forgive. And things that make you feel at peace, those are the things you forgive. The rest, you leave them hanging because you feel it's unjust what they're doing. So you don't forgive them. And God should judge them. And the wrath of God should fall on them. Because they are evil. They did wrong to me. See, and that is far from being reconciled with God. So your confession is worthless. Because there's something in your heart that is not reconciled with God. Because it's, you're not reconciled with your neighbor. And, and the gospel is very clear about that. It says if you're not reconciled with your neighbor, don't come before the altar of the Lord. Because the Lord is not going to forgive you. Regardless of what you do. 
your offering is going to be worth less. So we have to understand before we go to confession that you have to truly reconcile. That's why I say our biggest relationship with God begins with one another. That's what God said through Jesus. If you do not love your brother that you can see, how could you love me when you cannot see me? At the same time, the Lord taught me something very important. He said to me, I was in Portugal in the island of Funchal, in the island of Madeira, in the city of Funchal. And I was giving a retreat to the youth. And before lunchtime, there was questions and answers. And one of them asked me a question that anybody would think is a, is a stupid question. But I knew it wasn't. He asked me, why is God invisible? So I said to myself, I'm not going to answer this now. So I, I told him, when we come back from lunch, I'm going to answer. So I went to the Blessed Sacrament. We had an hour time. I was there like 45 minutes and no answer. Right? I was going, I walk in there and say, what are you going to tell him? She said, I don't know what to say. So I, I'm there waiting in my heart for some wisdom, right? Something, an inspiration as to how to answer. Like 45 minutes later, so clearly, the Lord showed me the answer. And he said, I am not invisible. I am perfectly visible. That's why you have to be perfect so you can see me. See, that was the answer. And that is the answer. God is visible, completely visible, but he is perfectly visible. And we are in an imperfect state. So he calls us to be perfect so we can see him. So that is the challenge. So today we understand what God is asking from us. He's asking for us to truly reconcile. And the true reconciliation is to go all around ourselves and inside ourselves and find out what is not reconciling us. It's very easy to fall into this type of a scrupulous life where we feel that we are great sinners and we do great things against God but forget about the main things because the scrupulosity itself is going to take us apart and take us away from true contrition because true contrition begins with meticulosity not with scrupulosity and being meticulous is being sincere being meticulous is being disciplined, obedient that's what it is that's being meticulous. And being obedient is no. Look around. I say, do you love everybody? No chance. I don't think so. You know? hey, are you able to forgive everybody? No chance. I don't think so. So all these things you have to confess is I'm not able to forgive. I have people I'm not able to forgive. I'm not able to love everybody. That is something to confess. You see, because the more you confess that, the weaker it gets. So the more you're going to be able to get to the right position where you're going to be able to love and forgive those that you're not able to love and forgive. And that's why confession is so powerful. Because the Lord is going to understand that you really want to do it. And one day, that whole building of unforgiveness and unloving building is going to crumble down. And you're going to be able to love. And you're going to be able to feel alive for the first time. You see, most diseases... Most mental and physical diseases come from unforgiveness and unloving feelings. That's where they come from. Most diseases, especially mental disease and a lot of physical diseases because of not forgiving and not loving. So you want to be healed? Go to confession on the right leg. You see, go to confession the right way. Reconcile with God with sincerity and honesty and integrity. And with meticulosity, go there and be detailed to yourself and God and be clean and straight with the priest. And don't worry about the priest. Imagine if you dine in the street and then the wrong priest comes along and says, No, him! No. <laughs> right? Bring me a holy one, I'm dying. No. You have, to, you have to really be ready. You have to use, you know, you have to go to the priest regardless of who they are. Because reconciliation is about reconciling yourself with the unreconcilable. You know, it's like, that's what reconciliation is. Reconcile with the unreconcilable. That is reconciliation. Because God makes it possible. What we are not able to do, God will do. So unfortunately, we ran out of time. And now we have to prepare ourselves for divine mercy. What an opportunity for us to reconcile. 
maybe not, of all, not all of us are going to have the opportunity and the time to make it to the confessionary because there's only one priest or two confessing. But we can begin by being on the side of the road by the Blessed Sacrament and telling Jesus like it is. Because if you go to confession tomorrow or the day after, it's fine. Because the Lord knows you already confessed to Him and the next thing you do is purify yourself with the priest. But it's good to prepare the heart to do that because that will make a big difference into what we came here to do this weekend. So may the Lord have mercy on us and help us to reconcile ourselves with Him. Amen.